Synonymous with learning, and among the most famous of university cities, Cambridge's history of and reputation for academic excellence are both widely known. On these streets have walked the great and the good, from politicians to poets and philosophers to physicists. But beyond the compass of the city itself, the county of Cambridgeshire conceals a lesser known history, one that speaks of its land, its character and its people. Located in the east of England, Cambridgeshire is not a county commonly associated with heavy industry, unlike its neighbour Northamptonshire. Yet, within its margins lie now disused industrial and agricultural railway lines, which either because of their obscurity or the memories they stir are surely of some historical interest. We begin in the south of the county, in a village synonymous with historical aviation, Duxford. Here, on the West Anglian main line, passengers speeding to and from Cambridge are unlikely to spot the spur of track that departs the railway just north of Hingston Road level crossing. Now gated from the main line, our first industrial line once served an adjacent industrial chemicals manufacturer. The spur departs west to the factory, but before it does, it is worth examining the siding, which runs parallel to the main line. Knotted and entwined with undergrowth, it is evident that this siding has not been used for many years. Indeed, within the gated area, this sign betrays that trains which once used this facility were from a different era altogether. Continuing along the siding, we reach its end, which is lost amongst the rampant growth of the trees and bushes. We return to the spur now, and see that it took quite a sharp westerly turn to the factory. On Hingston Lane we find the level crossing gates. It does not seem likely that these will open again any time soon. We reach as far as we can travel. Notice the security checkpoint to the right of the picture, which looks like it was as much for trains as it was for personnel travelling by car. We now proceed to the east of the county and, as it happens, stray into an enclave of Suffolk it was here on the former Cambridge to Mildenhall line that once a spur of track left the line and travelled half a mile to the Burwell Cement Works. Otherwise known as Stevenson Siding, the location of the line and the cement works are both quite remote, but telltale signs of its presence are to be found. The only known photograph of the spur goes some way to providing orientation. Notice the hut which housed the ground frame and the gate to the left of the picture. We should be seeing remnants of these shortly. Approximately the same location today. We enter the siding at the bottom of its J-like shape and immediately find the foundations of the ground frame hut seen in the previous photograph. Venturing further still, along the bottom of the J, the gateposts which held the gate across the line. And nearby, a length of rail with a hook in it, which presumably held the gate open as required.
Having taken the curve, we now proceed along the straight edge of the J towards the cement works. Here, a length of rail has been used in the construction of a bridge. The track bed approaching the cement works is now marked by tree growth. Located two thirds of the way along the branch, one can still find the only extant structure of any substance associated with the siding. This was the engine shed. Today, and for some time, it houses a classic bus which once belonged to the Guernsey Railway Company. Behind the shed, rails from the siding are to be found in a pile. Leaving the shed behind, the siding carried on only a little further. and reached its end at about this point. Alongside the disappearance of the siding, the factory's mull pit is now flooded, and structures from the works have long since been swept away. We now head to the northwest of the county, and into the Fenland landscape which characterizes the area. Here, in a remote corner of the Fens, one can find the remains of the Benwick Goods Railway. Located on the Ely to Peterborough line in the village of Turves, the Benwick Goods Railway opened in stages between 1897 and 1898 as a means of helping farmers to get their produce to market. Initially only providing a goods shed, it was only after some lobbying that the Great Eastern Railway provided a line to Benwick itself. This time-worn structure still bears about it the characteristic architecture of another era. Indeed, it is not the only structure from another era. Here, still in operation, is Three Horseshoes Junction signal box, which controlled access to the goods railway to the west. We stand on the track bed facing north towards Three Horseshoes Junction. This is the site of Quakers Drove siding and one of only two locations on the route where a building from the railway still stands. 50 years since the closure of the railway, this building has stood defenceless against both time and weather. Half a mile later, and under the shadow of a wind turbine, we encounter the site of West Fen Drove siding. Given the acres of fertile fields within the vicinity, the presence of a railway to take goods to market seems sensible. We now face south along the track bed, where half a mile later trains would reach Burnt House Drove siding. Burnt House Drove siding was, initially, the terminus of the route, when the line was extended to Benwick in 1898. Where the siding once stood, there is now a field of solar panels. We continue south. Here, on Backreach Drove, we find the second and last remaining building on the railway. Curiously, at this point, no siding is officially marked on any map, but clearly there was some connection to the line. This building has fared better than the one on Quakers Drove siding, in at least retaining part of its roof. From here, trains would travel a further mile and a half. They would then arrive at their terminus here at Benwick Goods Depot. The station building may be gone, but beneath the ivy on the left of the picture stands a mighty gatepost from the line. To the right of the picture was a wharf abutting the old course of the River Neen, permitting the delivery and collection of produce to continue by water. 
The line closed altogether in 1968. We travel now to the northeast of the county, and perhaps the most well known of the railways we encounter on this trip the Wisbeach and Upwell Tramway. Our journey along the route begins, in fact, in the Norfolk village of Upwell, five miles and 72 chains from Wisbeach, where one can still find the station master's lodge. Opened on the 20th of August 1883, the tramway was extended to Upwell in 1884. Like the Bennett Goods Railway, the route was built to help farmers get their produce to market. The depot here at Upwell had 11 sidings and, during the fruit picking season, the sidings could hold over 100 vans. The first of two commemorative information boards which mark the line's presence is to be found at the north end of the Upwell depot. Laden with produce and, until 1927, some passengers, our tram would begin its journey by following the course of this present-day footpath. Having crossed small load, our tram would strike out for its next point of call at a gentle maximum speed of 12 miles per hour. Now a private driveway, this was part of the tramway's course, something playfully alluded to by the sign on the left gatepost. One of the distinguishing characteristics of this line was the way in which it travelled not just along side roads, but on them in rails embedded in the surface. Such was the case here as trams trundled by the River Neen. And it is here we reach the line's original southern terminus, Outwell Village. The site of the depot was now housing. But marking the tramway's presence is this striking commemorative work. Nearby on Church Drove, this innocuous building is one of the tramway's few architectural survivors. This was the goods office, which oversaw the comings and goings of the depot's four sidings. Our tram departs, crossing the River Neen on the skew, and journeying parallel to the road for the next half a mile. Whereupon it would continue along what is now a private track. Standing guard over Basin Road, the posts which once held the crossing gates. Having crossed Basin Road, our tram arrives at our next depot, Outwell Basin. Today, access to the depot's site is difficult, but this shot gives an impression as to its whereabouts. Departing now for the next stop, the tramway's embankment is visible, even if it is overgrown. About a mile later, we reach the site of Boyce's Bridge Depot. All signs of the tramway are, at this point, non-existent. The next leg of our journey sees our tram run parallel to the west side of Outwell Road for the next two miles. Though not ideal footage, this certainly gives one the impression of how close to the road the trams were. Our tram approaches its penultimate point of call at Elmbridge Depot, opposite what is now the China Rose restaurant. Regrettably, on the day of filming, it was not possible to obtain a satisfying shot of the depot's site, though it can be glimpsed to the right of the picture in the hedging and bracken. No architectural remains are to be found. Now in Cambridgeshire, the Wisbeach itself, the tramway can be traced here on Elm Road by the green space which divides it from Churchill Road to the left of the picture. Our tram then takes a westerly curve, running parallel to the Watlington branch line before arriving at its northern terminus here at Wisbeach East. Dwindling freight traffic saw the tramway succumb to the beaching cuts of the 1960s. 
The line closed on the 23rd of May 1966, with the final train having run three days earlier. For our final exploration, we returned to the south of the county to look at a spur which served the Barrington Cement Works Railway. 50 miles and 77 chains from London King's Cross stands Foxton Station and its signal box, which, still manned, overlooks the line of the busy A10 crossing. Whilst the signal box's main charge is to monitor the crossing, it also guards the entrance to the line serving the Barrington Cement Works. Here, the line can be seen diverging north. We follow the curve of the line, which makes its way across a number of quiet, flat fields. The sign here is not altogether inaccurate, as the light railway which operated within the quarry's parameters continued to use steam locomotives for many years. The railway was, in fact, mothballed in the mid to late 2000s, and the quarry itself partly decommissioned in 2012. However, in 2010, plans to landscape the quarry were submitted and approved. Thus, the railway was restored to service. Travelling over these tracks once more, trains brought spoil from the Crossrail project in London to fill the quarry pits. Here, the line crosses the River Cam. We see the bridge railings in the distance. Here, the railway passes behind Malthouse Way. We face north on Glebe Road. The railway takes a final curve here before passing over Haslingfield Road crossing. We reached the limit of our exploration and the site of Barrington Cement Works. The buildings were recently demolished and work is underway to develop the area for housing. Whilst the future of the quarry site is determined, there is less certainty about the future of the spur from Foxton, with some speculation that it might be turned into a footpath or cycleway. We reach our journey's end, with our exploration of five lost railways complete. Each line, no matter how long or short, speaks of Cambridge's agricultural or industrial heritage. Whilst most of these lines have little or no operational future, we can at least preserve their presence in our memory. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, click the notification bell, share and enjoy rediscovering Lost Railways.